an American poet called Emily Dickinson. Here's the poem. A word is dead when it is said. Some say. I say it just begins to live that day. Did you hear that? I say it again. A word is dead when it is said. Some say. I say it just begins to live that day. Once you said a word, you can't take it back. You can't wind the clock back 30 seconds. You may wish you can, but you can't. It is said, it's a lie. Oh, you can put the tape back on now. It's back on. <laughs> and that's why I'm telling you. And in today's world, not just as it's said, it's gone global. It's now on the internet around the world. So you see, you must be so careful that what you say is wise and true and helpful and not hurtful. And the great risk in off the cuff. And if you're preaching and the adrenaline is pumping and the people are smiling and excited, you're getting excited. And off the cuff you say something. And once you say anything, oh, oh, oh no. no. That was just stupid. <laughs> Damage done. Damage done. And you know this. One sentence you say, which took you five seconds, can take you six months, really, to repair the damage in someone's life. They just say, Pastor, I cry. I find it, I find it so hurtful. And out they walk. Now you can't completely avoid that. And maybe the hurt is the prompting of the spirit, maybe. But often, it's the, the foolishness of the preacher. So, there are many good reasons, I find, to have the full text and not go off the cuff. One is, it protects me from saying things that later on I regret. So, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a full text person. What? Okay, what are the, a bad sermon? I could say a thousand things. I've heard lots. But two things. I have only two rules in preaching. Which if you pray, make a bad sermon. One, be faithful to the Bible. A sermon unfaithful to God's word is a bad sermon. Two, be interesting. That's all. Don't be boring. So in my view, a bad sermon isn't faithful to the Bible and makes the Bible boring. Don't make the Bible boring. Don't if you've got hungry people. Don't feed them tasteless, stodgy, non-nutritious food. They won't grow. In fact, they won't finish the meal. Don't leave the food on the plate. I asked it, when I worked in Pakistan, we used to have the, the, the star of the Bible College ran for dinner. Pakistanis grow up on curry. From the moment they eat, they're eating, I mean, hot curries. That's all they have. They can't eat non hot food. They just can't. It's like eating cardboard. So I have a grand dinner and we serve them a yummy western meal. They take three bites to be polite and leave the food on the plate and stay hungry because it's tasteless. The same thing happens with servants. When it's boring, they leave the food on the plate. In other words, they just switch off and don't listen and go away not fed. So my two rules are this, be faithful, be interesting, bad sermon, main thing, is not faithful, or is not clear, or is confusing, and is boring for people to see. Okay? Any other questions? Can you give us some advice or tips on how a preacher should preach to a congregation where there are youths? In the, in the congregation, you know, as young as 13 years old, and then you have the adults and the seniors. Mixed congregation. Yes. Um, 
I spoke at a convention last year in Queensland, Australia. It was a, a, a light up Bible convention, which is nice. Um, and at the end, uh, someone called James came up to me. And James said, oh, Mike, I want to say something like, I found your talks very helpful. And they give me something to really think about. So thank you so much. James is 12 years old. I didn't prepare my sermons with James in mind. I prepared my talks with his parents in mind. I think, by and large, a good sermon with an able preacher will speak to the Jameses who are 12 or 13 and keep them on the whole listening, though they might drift up a little bit, and also keep listening for everything. He's been a Bible teacher all his life. In other words, the Bible expert, the mature leader, and the young child should be able to listen to the talk. If the talk is clearly structured and not too confusing, if the language is easy to understand, if the illustrations are engaging. I am, I was asked a few years ago to speak at a convention for, uh, for, for kids ages 16, 17. And I said to the, to the guy who rang me up, I said, do you know how old I am? <laughs> I'm an old guy. There's a 40 year gap between us, me and them. Really? Oh, we want you to come. Well, it went really well. Because I just think if you, if you teach the Bible in an interesting way, look, you read out the prodigal son to people, all listen to it. All listen to it, young and old, heard Jesus teaching. So what my answer is, not much is different, in my view. If, if you're clear and interesting and can be understood, a, a child of 12 or 13, now James is quite smart, will, will understand you, and so will a mature person. So I, I, I don't change very much. Now, I might make my illustrations more appropriate to the teenager, if I, if I can, if I can relate to them. I won't quote the Beatles or <laughs> Elvis Presley. I might quote, what's her name? Just the Beatles. No, Who's the girl they all listen to? Taylor Swift. I might, I might quote Taylor Swift. <laughs> I might listen to a Taylor Swift song just to sound like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> or I'll talk about, I'll play a Star Wars movie on the screen. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like that. So I, I might try to change my illustrations. I might try to flip, flip the clock back four years and think what it was like for me back then. I might do that. But really, I wouldn't change that much. Okay? Right. Just, uh, if you look at your Bibles there, just, uh, just why, why we do this, why we teach the Bible, just turn to Nehemiah chapter 8. That's all we read out the first 12 verses. Just read it out. Then we'll look at one more passage briefly. So the, the, the exiles have returned from Babylon to Jerusalem to rebuild the city walls. Chapter 8. By the way, if I'm teaching the Bible, uh, I wait till the rustling of the pages has stopped. Before I give people time, to, or if they've got their, their well, they've finished flipping through their apps. Just so I wait for them to have the Bible in front of them before I begin speaking. Okay. All right. When the seventh month came, and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. 
I guess includes people like James, or who could understand. He read it out loud from the daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the Lord. Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah. And on his left were Padiah, Mishael, Malkijah, Hashum, Hashpadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God. And all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, Jeshua, Barney, Sherebiah, Jami, Akub, Shebathai, Hadiah, Hosea, Kalita, Azariah, Jezebel, Hanan, and Peliah instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. But they explained the law, they expanded the Bible. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. See, see so what we're doing today is nothing brand new. Okay. I didn't invent this kind of preaching. It goes right, way, way back to ancient Israel. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and the teacher of the law, and the Levites who were, who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. All the people have been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Their hearts were touched. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some to those who, who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to the Lord, uh, to, to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites called all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. And all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. I love that. It's a great passage about our role as teachers of God's word and the joy it brings God's people when they hear God's word. The joy. I, 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 when I speak at conventions sometimes, I'm quite strong in what I say. Sometimes. I, 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 I'm quite challenging, actually. Uh, like the other day, I spoke about fathers and, and uh, sorry, about husbands and wives, and I spoke briefly about domestic violence. And I've often spoken very strongly about that and called on men who are not loving their wives properly to repent. I mean, at times I get quite challenging. Never do people say to me, Oh, Mike, I wish you were less challenging. Can't you just be soft and gentle and be? They never say that. They never say that. They say, oh, Mike, thank you so much for your challenge. I needed to hear that. Now, I don't do it every time. I don't think get weighed down. But you see, God's people want to walk in obedience. Don't you? Do you want to obey Jesus? Of course you do. And we don't do it sometimes, but we want to. And if I give you help to do that, you're going to thank God for that. You are. So they, so they were rejoicing to hear the Lord Moses, which rebuked them. And they were thrilled because it made them more like God. They could please God. One more passage is uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. And this is probably my, my, my kind of key verse for my, my work as a preacher. Paul's just said that all scriptures God breathed. So now he says to Timothy, and to all of us who teach the word, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who did I speak in front of on Thursday and Friday nights? In the sight of God. 
Who did I speak in front of? At Christ Church Lagos on those two nights. Who did I speak in front of? Pardon? The congregation. The congregation. Correct. And? God. God. That's right. God. In fact, my main audience was God. He heard every word I said. Every word I said, he heard. Now yeah, people say to me, oh, Mike, I'm, I'm pastor. Not, not him. Okay, okay. Oh, my God, pastor. He's hopeless. He never preaches God's word. I'm sorry to hear that. Because one day, it won't be the church who say that. But be God. Who say, why did you never preach my word? I heard all your sins. <laughs> the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who, what? Who will judge the living and the dead, and in you of his appearing and his kingdom. Um, I, I do say to people who want to be preachers and teachers, run a cell group. Think before you put your hand down. To lead a cell group. Because of all the people in that cell group, the one who will be judged most harshly will be you. Because God has entrusted to you this little flock of his big flock. And has asked you to feed them and protect them. And one day, I'll stand before God to give an account of my preaching ministry. The God who heard my every sermon. And on that day, I want to be found faithful. So, it's good you're here. It's good you're here. Then he says, I give you this charge not, I give you a word of advice. Or, I think it would be a good idea that. I give you this charge. What's a charge? Tell me, what's a charge? Command. This? A command. Anything else? Yeah, it's a serious command, isn't it? It's a solemn command. When I got married, I was given a solemn charge. Love her till death you depart. For better or worse, that was a charge. Well, I got the charge. Preach the word in season, out of season. Now that's that's critical for me as I think about what I do. I, I give my talks, I prepare my talks, my full text, before God. Fearing God, who one day will judge me. And I hear the word, Mike. Let me give you an example. I, I, uh, I mentioned this one before. I was asked last year to take part in a dialogue on Islam with a Muslim scholar, a very nice man. The topic was living as neighbours. It was held in a university room. The place was packed with people. People sitting on the floor, around the edges in the foyer. We give it. 20 minutes to talk about how we can live together in society as Muslims and Christians and live together peacefully, living as neighbours. That's our topic. So he gave his talk about this topic. Then it was my turn to talk about living as neighbours, which I did. But I'm a preacher. My first task is to preach the gospel in season out of season. So the first half of my talk was a, a gentle word. I just explained, as I began, what we believe as Christians. I explained the gospel. Then I talked about living as neighbours. But I had a room full of people, many not Christians, and my charge from God 
in season, out of season, is to preach the word. So I did that in a way I felt was sensitive and wise. But that's, that's my charge. Okay, so that is, that, that, that's why I do what I do. Preach the word. Preach the word I just said, all scripture. That's, that's God's command to us. So it seems to me if you don't preach the word as a pastor, you failed. You've not obeyed the solemn charge. Now, one more thing before we move on, before I get you to do some work, is um, I, I do expository preaching. It's just a way of saying, I just preach the Bible. But let, me, let me quote an American preacher. Expository preaching is that kind of Christian preaching that takes as its central purpose the presentation and application of the text of the Bible. All other issues and concerns are subordinated or secondary to the central task of presenting the biblical text. As the Word of God, the text of Scripture has the right to establish both the substance and structure of the sermon. So genuine exposition takes place when the preacher sets forth the meaning and message of the Bible text. I'm like, it's like a, a president, an army ambassador. He says to me, uh, Mr. Ambassador, here's my message to give to the people in that country. I, I get the message. I travel that country. On the way, I open the message. I don't say, oh, no. They, they won't like that bit. I'm going to cut that bit out. No, no. My job is to bring to them the message from the president. That's what I'm doing. That's our central job. To open up the Bible, John 13, so people read it and hear it and obey it. That's, that's just, that's, that's extraordinary preaching. Nothing more, nothing less. And so what I, and what I do, uh, in my church mainly, is week by week, we hear John's Gospel. Or Habakkuk. We, we do topical preaching too, that's important, but that's our bread and butter. Now, I've got on, on your outlines, I've got, um, how many? Uh, ten reasons why I think it's good to preach this way. Number one. I believe that expulsory preaching is most likely to treat the Bible in the most faithful and accurate way possible. That you take the passage seriously and preach it to people. Number two, it gives your sermon divine authority. You can say to people, today God says to us, love like this. Wash feet like this, you can speak with authority because you've understood God's word. Thirdly, you expose to people the whole Bible because we're committed to all scripture. Fourthly, importantly, you teach your people how to read the Bible. You do two things when you preach bringing to people God's word, and over time, you're showing them how to read the Bible for themselves. So, as, as one preacher says, careful explanation of the Bible is not intended solely to provide a meal for the congregation. It's also to demonstrate how to cook so that each Christian discovers ways in which a Bible passage might be opened up. If they hear you week by week faithfully explain the Bible, that's what they'll begin to do. If you take a passage, pull out a verse out of context, then say, now, I think this means for my life, that's what they'll do. And they read their Bible. They'll pull a verse out of context and ask themselves, what's this mean for my life? If in your preaching of the Old Testament, you never point them to Jesus, when they read the Old Testament, they'll never see Jesus. Don't just, don't just, if, if you're the regular preacher, teacher, they'll do what you do. 
So you're both preaching and you're giving them a model for themselves how to read the Bible. So if your people don't know how to read the Bible, it's probably because that's not how you preach. Okay, um, number five, it, it benefits the people by focusing them on God's agenda in the scripture, not your hobby horse. We all have our favorite topics. That might be, um, uh, it might be a danger. <laughs> Every sermon is to tell people about Jesus. Well, it might be giving. You know, preachers love to talk about giving. It's amazing how many Bible passages talk about giving. Well, no, actually, not that many. Some. But he, he, he finds in every passage that's his agenda. And next one. Uh, it keeps you from, from neglecting parts of the Bible. You should preach it like Romans 9 to 11. It forces you to preach in the tough texts. It makes selecting a topic easier. Uh, I find preachers who preach a different topic each week can spend hours on the what, what do I preach on this Sunday? Oh, I mean, they spend hours deciding that. If you're working through Colossians and you finish chapter 1, verse 12, next Sunday, chapter 1, verse 13. It just makes it easier as a preacher if you work through books of the Bible. It saves you lots of time. Number eight, and, and then you don't have to do new research every time. Once you've researched the background of Colossians, it's done for the rest of the series. Number nine, importantly, it removes the accusation of conspiracy. Why pass the last two weeks that you talked about money? Because I'm preaching Luke. And Luke talks about money a lot, so don't blame me, blame Luke. <laughs> and finally, it provides a control for your sermon. If your topic is fatherhood, you can say a thousand things about fatherhood. If you have a text like Colossians, you say one thing. Fathers, don't be harsh with your children. It just gives you control for the sermon. Now, there is, I think, an important place for topical preaching. But in my view, the bread and butter of our preaching should be opening up God's word to God's people and has come to us in books and letters and poems and prophecies. So I don't just do this because this is the style that I like because I think this is the way to be most faithful to God's word and to give your people the whole counsel of God. Any questions on that? Uh, Re Reverend, uh, we we now have the benefit of the printing press and uh, uh, the uh, items like uh, computers and all that. Uh, but but this this is not really a question, but it's kind of like before the printing press and uh, even in places like China where they only have one page of the Bible, uh, can you comment on why the word is more effective in those times when compared to now when we have the entire uh, Bible? I mean I mean uh, in a sense I mean has technology kind of helped? To advance faith, or I guess. I'm not sure about your assumption that the Word of God was more effective back then. Um, but the Word of God can be preached. It can be preached orally. In the early days, it was just passed on. It, uh, before it was written down, it was passed on orally. Uh, and that's effective. It can be passed on in written form. It can be passed on on the, on the phone. So the Word of God can come in different forms. Uh, and, it's, and, it's, and it's powerful. The written form is one form, but not the only form. The written and the oral. Uh, but either form, see, yeah, the Word of God is powerful to achieve its purpose. But we are. We are we're blessed today with many resources. So we have, I think, less excuse today 
for not being faithful. Oh. Really. Yeah. You know, if you say, oh, I, I can't understand this passage, I just type in, in my, on my Google, I just Google, Matthew 5, 18, meaning. <laughs> and that comes all. So there are, there are resources there. So you know, we should have no excuse in the church today for not being faithful because we have so many more resources. Okay. Um, to put it another way, sort of, uh, what's your comments on? Uh, you have too much of the word, but it's not really very specific. I mean, like, uh, what's your comments on some people say, like, uh, manna for the day, or they sort of, like, the preacher preached something and it struck them. It was, like, some coincidental uh, grabs of, of the word, that kind of thing. Uh, because uh, you could read any resource now, but... Is that the is that the particular word for you, or you just happen to be accidentally there? Um, if, I'm not sure I entirely understand you, but um, you know, I read the Bible every day. I uh, I go to church on Sundays. I hear the I hear the word of God there. I train preachers. I hear lots of sermons. My work is training preachers. I hear eight, ten sermons a week. So I should be very, very godly. All the sermons <laughs> I hear. Uh, but there are sometimes, you know, uh, the Word of God will come to you in God's sovereignty with particular power. Uh, this sermon has always blessed me. But sometimes, because of a position in my life or the Word of the Spirit, something a preacher says particularly uh, encourages me or convicts me, that's, that probably would happen every time. It's like a meal. Yeah. Most meals are just they're good meals. They keep me healthy. Every meal isn't a wow, what a meal. <laughs> oh, fantastic. No, most meals are good meal. Occasionally, I take it out to a restaurant in KK. Whoa, what a meal. <laughs> and sermons are like that sometimes. It's sermons are food. And I will give my people nutritious food. Occasionally, my wife cooks up, he said, cooks up a storm. <laughs> Fantastic meal, which really, I really enjoy. Uh, and that, uh, same with preaching. I don't, I expect the servant to feed me. And if I'm not especially confronted, that's okay. That's okay. I, I've been fed. I've been nourished for the week, and I want that. But I pray to, Lord, if there are things in my life, you want to particularly highlight. Then do so by your word this week. That's, that's, that's the way it works. Okay, let me then move on. Uh, to preaching the gospel, I'm going to move down to you know, just a group work. I'm going to say five things briefly. Five principles of preaching the gospels. Now, um, could you want to look up, uh, look up for me? Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. And um, Ellie, can you do it up, please? Um, Mark 1, verse 1.